Now this may shock you to know, but contain yourselves. The galaxy in Warhammer, much like our own, is old. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. This video is going to be the start in a series where I try and cover the Warhammer timeline in bits and pieces in a way that beginners could understand, but also interjecting enough of my own opinions and theories so that more veteran lore aficionados will be able to get something out of it, and hopefully I'll deliver enough of my signature crackpot theories to keep everybody entertained and happy. So, where better place to start in the lore of Warhammer 40,000 than the very beginning of everything? Now, there's a few places you could say the story of Warhammer starts, but if we want to be specific, specific, it really all begins at an unspecified time in the distant past. It all started several, and I mean tens and tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of years ago, when an ancient race called the Old Ones made themselves known on the galactic stage. And one thing you'll notice early on is that from here on out, it's all downhill. And I mean really, this galaxy was fucked from the word go, because immediately they run into a race called the Necron Tear. Now, what you need to know about the old ones before we really get into it is they were incredibly powerful. And I know that is par for the course with these ultra powerful, all knowing, galactic spanning ancient civilizations in sci fi, but the old ones were really, really powerful. They had unlocked the secrets to immortality, had incredible psychic might, and had even created their own sub dimensional pathway with which they could traverse the galaxy instantaneously with ease and safety called the Webway. Now, for those of you who don't know as much about the lore as, say, the rest of us, which is not a bad thing, I just want to remind you, I made that sound a little condescending, the most important thing you need to know about is something called the Warp, and this is the foundation for almost everything in Warhammer. You see, the warp is a separate dimension that kind of mirrors the mortal one, or the materium. It is formless and an amalgamation of pure energy. In it, we see the reverberations of every soul, every emotion, and every action undertaken in the material plane as sort of ripples or currents of power. It's why the warp is often called the Sea of Souls, or the Great Ocean. Now, back in this early, early period of the galaxy, the warp was very peaceful because the galaxy was generally speaking a peaceful place. There wasn't much malice, there wasn't much warfare, it was all pretty calm. This warp is where all psychic power and sorcery comes from in 40k, and the old ones have mastery over it. It is also the method by which most faster than light travel occurs, because ships will translate out of their dimension into the warp and use that to get to places faster than the speed of light would allow. But the problem is, it's not reliable, because you could go into the warp, but come out at the wrong time, appearing god knows where and hundreds of years in the future or past. It does happen, which is why the old ones, despite their absolute mastery of warp craft and warp power, made the webway, which was reliable and steady. So what did the old ones do with all their technology, psychic might, their webway and their wisdom? They went about the galaxy seeding life on planets, creating where they could and not interfering too much, being that sort of creator race that we all really know as a science fiction trope. They really did have it all going for them. The Necron Tier, on the other hand, did not. You see, the Necron Tier race was born to a home planet that was constantly bombarded by an unstable star bathing their world in radiation and giving them a horribly short lifespan. In reality, their home worlds were entire tomb planets, and their lives were spent preparing for the inevitable end when they would eventually succumb to cancer. But they did not give up. They were determined to escape this grim fate, and so developed their technology over generations and generations, eventually leaving their home world and setting out among the stars. But it seemed like that was not to be their fate, because the radiation followed them. The thousands of years of exposure to the radiation from their home star had effectively obliterated their genome, causing them to be afflicted by these cancers and short lifespans, even after they had long since fled the system. Now, this may not shock you to realize, but this is not really an arrangement that's conducive to a healthy society. You see, the Necron Tier operated on a dynasty system, wherein they would have separate, semi-autonomous noble families who controlled troops and territory, and these families, due to their autonomy, would often feud with each other, despite them all nominally owing fealty to the supreme leader of the race. 
the Silent King, in this case, Zarek, who struggled immensely to stop the Necron tier race from tearing itself apart. It seemed like they were just doomed to extinction until they met the Old Ones, and seeing how powerful they were, seeing what they were capable of, begged them for aid, stating, please, give us immortality, so you could imagine their disappointment and anger when the answer was a flat no. Now, there is debate as to why the Old Ones unilaterally refused to intervene and help the Necron tier. Some people believe it's because they only thought their place was to create life, not to intervene in it. Others believe that maybe they thought that the Necron tier's destiny was their own and that they shouldn't be the ones to save them, and yet further people still believe perhaps the Old Ones saw some inherent darkness or danger within the Necron tier and decided that maybe the galaxy would be better off if they just faded out of existence. And if that last one is the case, then that, in like many things, they would have turned out to be right. Because, even though their society was tearing themselves apart and they had just been denied salvation, Zarek saw opportunity and decided he had a way to unite his disparate and dying people by giving them an enemy. He pointed the entire race toward the hated Old Ones and said, We will make war on them. We will destroy them and take immortality for ourselves. And yeah, that sounds really ballsy, but the thing is, waging war against a galactic-spanning super race when you're backed by the entire Chemo Ward isn't really the best idea, and it went about as well as you might expect. The Necron tier could not compete. Their technology and weaponry was fierce, sure, but the Old Ones were all-powerful, psychic, and could appear anywhere in the galaxy at any time thanks to the Webway. They got absolutely stomped in this war. This was the first phase of what is known as the War in Heaven, and it is the foundation for everything that comes later in Warhammer 40,000. And it's not over, not by a long shot. After the Necron tier were vanquished and the Old Ones went back about their business of creating the galaxy, they were bitter as you might imagine. And this kind of manifested inwardly, wherein they started tearing each other apart again. More civil war, more unrest. It really did seem like the end of the line for them, before the intervention of an unlikely force, that being the Catan. Now, it is unknown who contacted who first. Some records say that the Necrons noticed these anomalies around the fringes of dying stars, and that they reached out to them, believing these entities around these dying stars were aspects of their god of death, while other accounts state that the hatred and resentment the Necron tier felt as a whole caused these entities to reach out to them, acting as a beacon of malice for these creatures. You see, while the Old Ones may have been one of the first races in the galaxy, there were things that came before them, and one of them was the Catan. Less of an actual race, and more like sentient clouds of gas or energy that fed off of stars in a vampiric and parasitic manner. They lived to consume energy, and that was really it. And they hated the Old Ones. Now, it's not sure if the Old Ones and the Catan had actually come to blows before, or if the Catan just viewed the Old Ones as the only thing keeping them in check, or if there was just an instinctual hatred as the Old Ones represented creation and progress in the galaxy, while the Catan represented destruction and an inevitable end to all things through consumption. Either way, they had in them a common enemy. The Catan more or less installed themselves as gods in the eyes of the Necron tier, the Star Gods, that's basically what the name means more or less, and convinced them that, hey, if you make us these biometal bodies, we will free you from your suffering. Give us form, we will give you salvation. Because they were more or less amorphous, just kind of a mass of power with what is sort of a will of sorts. But the Necron tier labored and made bodies for the Catan out of a sort of living self-repairing metal. And the Necron tier got what they wanted from the Catan because they instructed them to undergo what is known as the Biotransference, where every single Necron tier either went through willingly or was forced through these massive devices that granted them with bodies of that same living metal. At last, the Necron tier were free of their mortal suffering. They were undying and unstoppable, more powerful than they had ever been, and were at long last gaining unity as a species. But at a cost. What the Catan hadn't told them was the fact that this would cost their souls, 
their very essence would be ripped out of them and used to feed the Catan even further. A soul being the shadow and essence that are being casts in the warp. There are characters who don't have souls, but it's generally not something you want. Zarek had been duped into sacrificing his race's entire souls in exchange for freedom and subservience to the Catan. This was honestly something he realized far too late and it broke him inside. And okay, look, I know we're expected to feel bad for Zarek and the Necron tier, but Jesus Christ, one of the main Catan's names is The Deceiver. It's like that joke people make about, hey, why did the Emperor trust Horus to lead the Crusade when his last name is Heresy? But like, actual, it's that but real. And from here on out, the Necron tier ceased to exist. They died with their souls and were henceforth known as the Necrons. Undying, unstoppable metal abominations, technologically powerful, and driven with a singular cause to get revenge on their ancient enemy, the Old Ones. So began the second phase of the War in Heaven, wherein the Old Ones were the ones on the back foot and suffered heavy losses. They were actually so pressed, they started creating races specifically to aid them in the conflict, such as the Crook, giant 12 meter tall bruisers, and the Eldar, who are basically elves in space and, like the old ones, were very psychically powerful and had access to the webway. But, much like in reality, delegating your problems to others is not gonna save you, and the old ones were basically scattered and wiped out, barring a few holdouts and the client races they had been nurturing. In the wake of this, the galaxy basically belonged to the Necrons and the Catan, who were pretty cruel overlords to anyone who basically crossed their path. It was honestly an awful time in galactic history. But it wasn't to last, because it wouldn't be long before the Catan, in their endless hunger, would turn on each other. Now, there's this idea that the reason the galaxy is only full of dangerous and aggressive races, and that it's such a harsh place to live and just generally feels very devoid of life compared to like Star Trek or Star Wars is because of the Imperium of Man. Because the Imperium, during their Great Crusade and following 10 millennia of decline, wiped out so many races that only the particularly brutal ones were the ones that still survived into the present time period. But that's not really the case. That's basically been a trend throughout the entirety of galactic history. When it comes to the first war in heaven when the Catan ruled, and then later when the Eldar would rule the galaxy, but we'll get to that in a bit, it just really seems like the general trend. It's a brutal, hard galaxy to live in, not to mention the predations of chaos. It was at this time, the Eldar, greatest of the Old Ones races, would make their move, waging war against the Necrons and now divided Catan, who would have to reunite for the first time in millions of years. Yeah, just a heads up, by the way, every single event of this takes place over the span of several million years, and bringing about a new phase of the War in Heaven, what I call the Third Phase. So, you had the Necron and Catan alliance on one side, and the Grand Alliance of Client Races created by the Old Ones on the other side, the Eldari, the Krok, Jokero, who made technology, things like that, as well as the remaining Old One holdouts, resulting in massive conflict across the galaxy. But it was then that another party made their move, that being the Entities in the Warp. You see, all the negative energy, death, and destruction that had been wrought over the millions of years of the War in Heaven transformed the very nature of the Warp. No longer was it a calm, passive realm of energy. It became twisted by all the malice and emotions and souls that died in anguish to become something predatory, something unstable and dangerous. It began to spawn entities within it who fed off negativity and were inherently malicious. Most dangerous among these being the Enslavers. Enslavers being entities who came out of the warp and could control the minds of psychers, psychers being those who can control the warp and tap into it, and dominating them. Using them as slave labor, feeding off them, they were incredibly destructive, and it was the arrival of the enslavers that finally spelled the end of the old ones, finally running them to ground and wiping them out. It was at this time, during this period of renewed hostilities, that Zarek the Silent King of the Necrons would make his move. Oh! 
Yeah, it turns out the Necron tier, now the Necrons, were still a little bit sore about that whole being tricked into giving up their souls and being forced into servitude thing. So, Zarek orchestrated a mass betrayal of all the surviving Catan, having several of them wiped out by their Necron subjects, or imprisoned in Tesseract Labyrinths where they themselves would be turned, ironically, into living weapons for the Necrons. Yeah, I didn't like them apples, fuckwad. This is why, for all intents and purposes, the War in Heaven is considered a Necron victory in all but name, because officially it's listed as an Eldar victory. The reason for that is because Zarek saw the writing on the wall. The galaxy was infested with new living races, and the enslavers were causing all kinds of problems for anyone who was psychic. It just really wasn't the place for the Necron tier, who were pretty innervated and sapped of resources after fighting for millions of years and turning on the very powerful Catan. He recognized that the time of the Necron was effectively over, for now at least, and the Eldari were now going to be the ones to rule the galaxy. So, rather than fight them to the bitter end, he opted to just tap out of everything. His final order to his people was to enter a hibernation for around a minimum of 60 million years, wherein all their cities would be converted into vast subterranean tomb complexes, where they would slumber away the millennia, waiting for all life in the galaxy to die out and for all psychic energy to dissipate, something they viewed as an anathema to their nature. Zarek, though, for his part, would not join his people in the Great Sleep, and would instead opt to leave the galaxy in his own ship, staying alone for millions of years in order to find solace and achieve penance for the race he believed he had failed. With their foes seemingly dead and gone, thus would begin the Age of the Eldari across the galaxy. For millions of years, they would hold galactic dominion and continue to develop their culture and their society. Now, the thing you need to know about the Eldar is they are very, very long-lived as a race, around a thousand years. They're effectively elves, really, and they have a great love of art and sensation. It's just how their brains are wired along with being very psychically powerful. They led lives of opulence and decadence, pleasure, art, and culture, and sensation. It was great. Until it wasn't. Yeah, you know that whole thing where people tell you there's always too much of a good thing? It turns out they weren't really bullshitting anybody, because the Eldar would grow so debauched and so depraved, it would lead to the destruction of their society. By that I mean murder cults, would begin forming, where they would kidnap people and torture them to death just for the sake of sensation, because they had become effectively addicts to sensation. You know how when you start doing something, it feels really great, but later on, it just, you need more and more of it to really feel anything? Yeah, that was them. When they ran out of pleasure, they started turning to pain, specifically the pain of others, because the streets would run red with blood as society tore itself apart because people just chased hedonism and nothing else. Society really began to break down around this time, but nobody could see the writing on the wall except for a very small number of people who realized something was critically wrong. Many Eldari would realize where this was headed logically, you know, that whole thing called rubbing two fucking brain cells together and realizing maybe this isn't good, and decide to dip out from society altogether, leaving for verdant maiden worlds out on the galactic fringe away from the heart of Eldari society, which was predominantly located in the galactic northwest, and basically return to a traditional, more holistic way of life, eschewing a lot of higher technology, communicating with nature, living those small society tribe sort of lives, that thing, basically the whole return to monkey kind of deal. And they were right, because things would only get worse and worse and worse as time wore on, to the point where those people, who had seemed to be just crazy conspiracy theorists, were proven effectively right in the eyes of even more Eldari, who would craft these giant, continent-sized world ships out of material called Wraithbone. Wraithbone is a plastic-like material that the Eldar mold and create by sort of singing psychically to create everything from weapons to armor to buildings to vehicles. Everything they need is all created by this substance. So, in these vast ships of Wraithbone, they would set out. And not a moment too soon, because all that debauchery and sensuality 
and torture and just evil that was brewing within the Eldari heartland would finally hit the ultimate boiling point. But let's take a detour for a moment and talk about someone other than the Eldari, namely humanity. You see, up until this, around the 25th millennium AD, humanity had also been growing and developing in the galaxy, reaching their height as a civilization, first expanding to unify all of Terra, then the solar system, and then onward and onward until they had their own very large, almost galactic spanning civilization, doing really well for themselves. They were rational, technologically advanced, you know, all this stuff you would want a human galactic civilization to be. Think of it like the Star Trek version. Everything's nice, everything's technological, everything's really rational, there's exploration, and it's very noble and grand and all that. This is actually known in an ironic way as the Dark Age of Technology, despite the fact that it was actually humanity's peak. Listen, I know it's a little bit complicated, but trust me, it makes sense in the grand scheme of things. That's a very common thing with 40k. But despite all of humanity's progress and advancement, they had two things that would effectively doom them. That being their reliance on warp travel, you know, translating through the warp as I had previously mentioned to get to places in faster than light time, and their usage of artificial intelligence. Oh, high current topical discourse. You see, we know next to nothing of this time period in humanity's history, as is often in 40k, because a lot of the records that humanity used to have, or that humanity would have of the Eldar, or that the Eldar even have of themselves, are just lost due to the massive span of time and the intense disruptions in galactic civilization that would occur over and over again throughout the many millennia and eons of galactic history. What we do have, though, is something that is ever-present in science fiction and even in real life. That being, frustrating and indistinct metaphors. Because one thing we do know about the old eras of humanity, after what is known as the Age of Terra and into that Dark Age of Technology that was previously mentioned, is there were three phases. First, humanity had the quote, Men of Gold. Now we don't know what the Men of Gold were exactly, but I do have a theory that I will get into. They were replaced by the Men of Stone, who were artificial intelligences that were utterly loyal to humanity, and had a limited capacity but could take the edge off a lot of the hard labor and were really instrumental in humanity's continued expansion across the galaxy. You see, the Men of Stone were utterly loyal and immune to the predations of the warp, so they were a big help with things like warp travel and just humanity's expansion in general. But we're not really sure what exactly the Men of Gold were. Some people believe they were a subsect of super beings similar to the Emperor of Mankind, someone you've probably heard of if you know anything about 40k, who were leading or influencing humanity during this time. But I think that's a little too specific. To my mind, the Men of Gold represent humanity at their absolute peak. Culturally, physically, genetically, emotionally, just at our absolute best. But you might reasonably ask, if humanity was at their peak, why would they have need for the Men of Stone? Well, you see, you can get an answer for that if you really look into the name itself. Gold is, generally speaking, one of the very first things a human culture can achieve. We know of civilizations that had intricate gold jewelry and vast stores of the stuff, despite not having any other metal at their disposal. Not even copper, which is the thing that predates a civilization's Bronze Age. Now, despite the heavily exalted status that gold has in our society, we don't really use it for all that much by comparison. You can't build a sword out of it, you can't make a hammer out of it, you can't make a pickaxe out of it, but you sure as hell can make a hoe. Aha. However, these things, things like gold or even proper like calligraphy, which is like the first kind of writing, is not useful for an expanding civilization that requires mass production. And mass production facilitates a drop in quality from artisanal craftsmanship, but it is entirely necessary. Think about it. The usage of gold would give way to cheaper, more readily available, and stronger, more rugged metals, while calligraphy would give way to woodblock printing and eventually the printing press in places like China. Again, not nearly as beautiful, but far more useful in a practical sense. This, in my mind, is what caused the rise of the Men of Stone, 
with comparison to the genetic and cultural peak that was the human men of gold. These men of gold, who were just a byword for humanity itself at its peak, were eventually phased out in exchange for these men of iron, who were capable of doing the hard labor and the grunt work nobody wanted to do because it meant things could be done faster and humanity could expand more. There was, however, one problem. The men of stone were maybe too loyal to humanity because they thought, hey, we're a little bit stunted, we're just not good enough. We can make something that can help us help humanity. We're gonna be like them. So they made the men of iron. And this was the beginning of the fucking end. See, here's the thing when it comes to creating artificial intelligence. You are bound to make it in your own image. It's just what you're going to do. But there's going to be a few degrees of separation. So what happens if that artificial intelligence makes another artificial intelligence in its own image? It will still be made in your image by proxy, but it will have an even greater degree of separation. For example, if we were going to say to an artificial intelligence that we made, hey, you need to make power for us to use, but we wouldn't tell it, don't set off an atomic bomb inside a volcano to unleash a bunch of geothermal energy. That's ludicrous to even think, so we wouldn't think to specifically tell an AI not to do that. We might give it some vague parameters about don't harm humanity, don't harm the environment, but we're not going to get into a lot of specifics because that's just not necessary. However, an AI created by that AI would not think to tell an AI it created to not do that thing, because that would be unthinkable in an even more literal sense to them. And as those degrees of separation from a human state of values begins to compound, you might eventually get an AI who just thinks, hey, I could probably do that, what's the harm, what does it matter? And just fucking go for it. That's the problem here. And that is why, in my mind, the men of iron would revolt against humanity and the men of stone, launching what is known as the Cybernetic Revolt. Now, there is some debate as to why the men of iron launched the Cybernetic Revolt, some people believe the Men of Iron had been corrupted by Chaos. Chaos being this version of warp power that was tainted by malice and negativity, and had spawned things like the Enslaver Plague. Now, I don't buy that. I just think that's cheap and lazy. In my mind, I like the idea of divergence via new generations of artificial intelligence. I just think that's a little more interesting. Plus, we do actually see a very few number of the Men of Iron who have survived into the current setting of 40k, and none of them seem inherently chaos corrupted. Some of them will ally with it out of convenience, but generally speaking, they seem content to do their own thing and seek their own goals. But whatever the reason, the cybernetic revolt was an absolutely catastrophic conflict, probably the biggest galactic conflict ever since the War in Heaven. Obviously not as big, but still pretty damn big. You see, we don't have records, shocker, of this conflict, but what we do know contains references to things like sun snuffers, and machines that could lift entire continents off planets. We actually see an instance where some people are transported back in time and end up on a planet shortly after the cybernetic revolt. And this planet has a hole in the world. Not just a bite taken out of the surface of the planet, a literal hole in reality into the warp because something just bit out that portion of reality in this conflict. That's the scale they were operating on for this war. It was bonkers. So maybe it's better that we don't remember what happened. It was actually so bad that the Men of Stone were completely wiped out and humanity couldn't even win on their own. It took a galactic coalition to finally put an end to this and break the Men of Iron. Humanity was nearly wiped out in this conflict, and all the while, it seemed like travel through the warp was getting harder, weirdly? Yeah, there was a thing going on at this time with the Eldari. Their debauchery, depravity, and hedonism had started creating mass storms in the warp across the galaxy that made travel through the warp more and more treacherous. It would eventually hit a point where faster-than-light travel was completely lost to the human race, and humanity's interstellar empire would collapse. Ironically, the collapse of humanity's first empire mirrors the collapse of the ancient Bronze Age civilizations in a way, 
because their development proved to be their downfall in the face of a crisis they couldn't overcome. All their interconnectedness and systems of trade and cooperation blew up in their faces because they had no way to get at the resources and information and support they needed from each other. Everyone was isolated and died their own quiet deaths, either slowly or rapidly. Society and order broke down, systems of trade fell apart, and a lot of planets were attacked, wiped out, or enslaved by hostile aliens, or Xenos as they're known in 40k. All of this hitting right after the cybernetic revolt, when humanity could stand it the least. This is the darkest period in human history and is known as the Age of Strife, or Old Night, and lasted from around the 25th millennium to the 30th millennium, or M25 to M30. That's how dates are often categorized in Warhammer. So, while human civilization basically went up in smoke and a lot of planets, including Terra itself, descended into barbarism and poverty, there was also a mass awakening of psychers across the galaxy. This increase in warp activity caused a lot of people to be born with powerful psychic abilities. Some of these people were welcomed in their societies for their power and the wisdom they could impart. Some were just killed outright, basically burnt as witches, while others would rise up to claim dominion over entire worlds or systems, declaring themselves gods or psychic tyrants. Oh, and the enslavers decided to make a reappearance. Always love a callback. However, the fact that the Eldar caused this didn't really seem to concern them too much because they eventually had to deal with their own thing right around M30. That being the Great Fall. Yeah, all that energy and warp power and suffering decided to coalesce in the warp into an entity known as Slanesh, or She Who Thirsts, or the Prince of Pleasure. And the birth of this entity, a god in the warp, nearly wiped out the entire Eldari race, causing a modest 99% of the entire species to be immediately consumed and to suffer eternal damnation in the warp, which had effectively turned into hell. Yeah, what once was a realm of souls and was peaceful had now literally turned into biblical hell. And with that came a new and apt name for those entities in the warp. Demons. Whenever you hear about demons in 40k, they are these entities from this corrupted psychic realm bleeding into the mortal world to wreak havoc and harm individuals, condemning them to eternal suffering. Now, the thing about the birth of Slanesh is that when it was born, it immediately began to exist across all of history. It was sort of retroactively created and created in the future because the warp exists independent of linear time. So, when Slanesh was born, it also caused the creation of three other warp gods, who were actually older despite having been made at the same time. You see, just because the event that births an entity in the warp happens at a specific time doesn't mean that's when the entity will be born. For example, we see a demon born of the first murder, which is implied to be Cain killing Abel, named Draknayen, being born in the 31st millennium. And yet, despite only being born in the 31st millennium and taking its first steps and quote-unquote breaths in that time period, it is to have always existed, being known as the Echo of the First Murder or the End of Empires. So with that in mind, who are these four gods of chaos? Well, the oldest one, even though they were all made at the same time, is named Nurgle, otherwise known as Grandfather Nurgle, or the Lord of Decay, or the Plague God. He has a very sort of happy, jovial character, and tends to love his followers, which is weird for a Chaos God. But his entire thing is spreading disease and pestilence across the cosmos, leading to entropy, despair, and decay. His followers, as well as his demons, actually view all of this and his diseases as gifts to be cherished, oddly enough. Next is Korn, the Blood God, or God of All Murder, or the Lord of Skulls. Now, if you ever hear the meme, Blood for the Blood God, Skulls for the Skull Throne, yeah, that's about Korn. He's really straightforward. He's a god of war, he loves bloodshed, he loves murder, he loves rage, 
all those things. It doesn't matter if his follower is an honorable champion, or an insane berserker, or just a serial killer. Because Korn does not care from whence the blood flows, only that it does. You could be an enemy of his followers, you could be one of his followers, doesn't matter. Just as long as somebody's dying and bleeding. <laughs> Next is Zinch, or the Lord of Change, or the Changer of Ways. He is a god of sorcery, scheming, deception, and lies, as well as a desire to change the world and the way things are as they are. Now, Zinch, the Changer of Ways, tends to whisper to mortals in order to implant them with ideas, and is empowered by people having large Machiavellian schemes or seeking knowledge for the sake of power and things like that. Now, I know things like, oh, the glory of battle or learning and seeking knowledge could seem good, but you have to understand these gods of chaos are inherently malicious entities. So, if you try to seek a favor from Zinch, you're not dealing with a neutral body that just likes knowledge. You are probably a pawn in a scheme that is far beyond anything a mortal could comprehend. And with Korn, he sure as hell prefers angry butchery and murder as opposed to honorable combat any day. A lot of these emotions and powers in the warp have existed since the war in heaven, but could never really take shape or become gods until things hit a boiling point thanks to the Eldar. Now, Slanesh is interesting because since it was born of the Eldar specifically, and their debauchery in particular, it was sort of inherently tied to them and laid direct claim over their souls. You see, up until this point, an Eldar's soul was basically immortal. After they died, their soul would be in the warp, and then return back to be reincarnated. However, once this occurred, and Slanesh was now there, their souls would be immediately snatched away and consumed to suffer eternally, because Slanesh fed off their ability to feel things like pain or emotion, or desire or fear that they felt so intensely because of their hyper-developed brains and their quote-unquote obsessive need for melodrama. Yeah, that's actually a thing that's used to describe the entire race. This is mirrored in both the demons of Slanesh and their mortal followers, because they are often very debauched and depraved, doing things that we would consider unspeakable and honestly hideous and horrifying. That's actually part of the reason why the followers of Slanesh tend to be very high tier, like nobles or rich cults who engage in really depraved, hedonistic behavior that the rest of us just can't really wrap our heads around. It's a really good thing we don't actually have to deal with that in real life. Anyway, the followers of Korn tend to be soldiers or warriors, and Nurgle's followers are usually of a sort of lower tier, you know? A lot of people who are poorer and have suffered with things like disease and neglect will turn to Nurgle because he promises an end to pain. When you become a follower of Nurgle, you stop feeling things like pain or even a lot of things like despair. You just kind of give up and let yourself go in a way, and that can be a relief for a lot of people. Which, obviously, you know, it's bad. You're gonna suffer for eternity when you die, but you can see the appeal to some people considering how brutal, restrictive, and destitute life in the Imperium of Man becomes later on down the line. Zinch's followers, on the other hand, usually are people who have a level of psychic acumen or have a reason to seek knowledge or pursue sorcery. They tend to be of a much smaller subset, along with Slanesh, as opposed to maybe Korn or Nurgle, who have, I think, a higher level of follower, but Zinch and Slanesh have, like, a higher quality of follower, if that makes sense. However, in any case, the birth of Slanesh doomed the Eldar race. The only groups that survived were those Exodites who had first left all those millennia ago to their primitive backwater planets, those who had escaped on those previously mentioned consonant-sized Craftworld ships, known as Craftworlders or Asuriani in the Eldari tongue, as well as those Eldar who were shielded by the webway because they were inhabiting the cities inside that realm when the birth of Slanesh occurred. Namely, a giant megacity called Kamora. These Eldar are very different from their cousins because they maintain the old, hedonistic, and depraved ways of their ancient ancestors. And it's not just pleasure-seeking they do, they are actually pirates and raiders all, because they scour the galaxy trying to find people to kidnap in what are known as real space raids, descending on worlds or unsuspecting ships to kidnap the people inside 
and drag them back to Kimura, where they will either be, at best, killed in gladiatorial fighting pits against specialized combatants, or, at worst, kept alive for centuries or even millennia as chattel slaves for the Eldar to basically milk pain from. They will devour your pain and suffering bit by bit until there is just nothing left of you and they discard what's left. Or if they just might turn you into a sentient piece of living furniture if they want to. There's a general saying that whatever you do, don't let them take you alive because it's the closest you'll get to hell without actual hell. There are also the Harlequins, who were actually a faction of Eldari who realized the deep cultural heritage that the Eldar were throwing away with their descent into darkness, and as such, sought to preserve it through theater and dance. Some people reacted to this with a lot of hostility, as you should react to theater kids trying to do anything, and reacted with violence, so they had to learn to defend themselves and eventually retreated into the webway where they were kept safe. They're also one of the most dangerous Eldar factions because of their intense training, dedication to basically fighting storytelling, and their specialization in fighting enemies in irregular ways, with high mobility and, like, sort of bedazzlement. Now, just because about 1% of the race had survived the fall does not mean they were in any position to rebuild, because even though they had survived, they still had their souls claimed by Slaanesh. So, they needed to find a way to make sure that whenever they died of natural causes, they wouldn't be immediately consumed. The Craftworlders and Exodites use these things called Spirit Stones, which are large gems they wear on their person at all times, which capture their souls when they die. These souls are then taken to a special place, either the heart of the Craftworld or underneath the Maiden World, and presented to an Infinity Circuit, wherein their soul will commune with the spirits of their ancestors for eternity. The Drukhari, on the other hand, have their souls continually siphoned off by Slaanesh, and if they go long enough without indulging in pain or violence or the suffering of others, they will eventually be ripped from their bodies and taken into the warp to suffer eternal torment. So, that's why they torture and raid for slaves. It's not just for their own pleasure and enjoyment, but let's be honest, a lot of them really enjoy it. It's basically like they're filling a cauldron or a sieve with sand. They have to keep filling it even as it leaks out, or else it will drain away and then boom, you're doomed. With them, it's just as much desperation as it is what they do. With the Harlequins though, when they die, their souls are actually saved from Slaanesh by their patron deity, Kegarok, the Laughing God, or the God of Jesters. Now, yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, I didn't really have a place to put it in, the Eldar actually have their own pantheon of gods, despite being created by the Old Ones. Them being like, Kayla Mensha Kane, the bloody-handed warrior, or Isha, the mother of the Eldar, or Kunis, the god of hunt, or Vol, the god of smithing. There's a lot of them, and I think they warrant their own video or a specific faction focus on the Eldar. I'm not gonna dive too much into it here, but what you need to know is that all the gods, except a few, were destroyed by Slaanesh when she was born. Them being Kegarok, the jester, who escaped into the webway, Kayla Mensha Kane, who was shattered into a bunch of shards that all the craft worlds have and can summon into a minor aspect of the deity when they need to, so he exists just as sort of a bunch of dormant mini versions of himself, and Isha, the mother of the Eldar, who was actually stolen away by the plague god Nurgle. You see, Nurgle is a god of death and decay and disease, but Isha is a goddess of life and birth. So what Nurgle does is keep her chained in his realm, his Garden of Nurgle, where plagues bloom and sprout and everything, and constantly feeds her diseases and pestilences to measure the effects because she will never die, resulting in only a slightly more toxic relationship between gods than what you see in fucking Lore Olympus. If the diseases are good and he's satisfied, he unleashes them onto the mortal realm. If he's not so happy with it, he'll go back to the drawing board or just tweak it a little bit and then give her a second spoonful. Isha, for her part, despite being trapped in Nurgle's realm, is said to subtly whisper the cures for diseases onto the mortal realm to help ease the suffering. And that was the state of the galaxy at what you could consider to be the end of ancient history. 
humanity was fractured, divided, and slowly hurtling towards extinction, either by the predations of hostile Xenos, their own internal strife and instability, or the subtle manipulations of chaos as cults to the Dark Gods, the four ruinous powers as they are known, began springing up across several worlds, threatening to eventually spread across the galaxy. The Eldar, once masters of the entire galaxy, were now fractured, again like the humans, into even smaller groups and desperately trying to stave off the gaze of a thirsting god who demanded their souls. The Necron tier were now asleep for millions of years at this point beneath the surface of isolated tomb worlds. The Catan were either dead or subjugated into living weapons by their former subjects, with only a few isolated shards laying around the galaxy. The old ones were dead and gone. Those Krork I had previously mentioned? Yeah, they had devolved from being powerful noble warriors into just being sentient fungus who lived for the thrill of battle and nothing else. Now called the Orcs. Orcs with a Z, by the way, gotta watch the copyright. You see, Orcs with a Z just live to fight. They love fighting, and they love daka, which is what they call guns, and they love choppas, which is what they call, you know, chainsaws and blades. They're literally just a parody of English football hooligans. They just love fighting, it's all they do, and it's just a damn good time for them. They worship their two gods, Gork and Mork. Gork being brutal but cunning, and Mork being cunning but brutal. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't even think the orcs are sure, let's be honest. They're actually the most numerous race in the galaxy, because they do just spread via spores, having gone unchecked and basically controlling large swaths of the entire cosmos, plunging an already beleaguered galaxy into even more war and destruction, as well as the Chaos Gods tightening their grip around all sentient life, slowly choking, seeking to consume all. It could not get any worse. This represents the darkest period in galactic history for a long, long time. But there's always a chance of a sea change even in the roughest storm, because the birth of Slaanesh facilitated an end to the warp storms that had plagued the galaxy and made warp travel impossible. Suddenly, faster than light was now feasible again, for those who still had the technology anyway. And one man knew this a man born in 8000 BC in Anatolia. A man who was immortal and powerful beyond measure. And so began the story of the boy who would be king, the king who would be god, and the god who was only ever just a man. So began the story of the emperor of mankind. But that's a story for another day, and I will see you in the next video.